Shh. Um, Ona is a designer and researcher, and today we're going to be talking to you about ethical design practices for Web3. Um, we're going to start with a map of the territory with some terms and examples from the current landscape. We'll move to some things that we've been observing and then talk about how we plan to move forward with what we've learned. The intention of this talk is to act as a conversation starter on how we can work with all of you towards designing a better future for the web. So the practices of product design are well established. We know that functionality, um, reliability, usability, and delight are the components of good UX. Importantly, this, these components build upon each other, so working on the usability of a non-functional product will not lead to the desired outcomes. Um, it kind of seems to me like there's a piece missing from this hierarchy. And it's ethics, specifically user control. Without it, we believe there's a fundamental flaw in the process of creating human-centered products. The era of surveillance capitalism. So basically, it kind of feels like we're being recorded every moment, um, with little to no control over what data we share, who we share it with, and how it's used. Our personal data, age, address, phone number, browser history, credit card info, are all in custody of companies that sometimes use this data for their own bottom lines. So how did we get here? Dark patterns are tricks used in websites and applications um, that encourage you to do things you just didn't necessarily need to do. You've likely been frustrated by an experience that you got into because of these patterns. They're known near on the so the first pattern I'll mention is called privacy zuckering. Um, in this case, the user has no choice but to accept these terms in order to use the service, which includes posting tweets on your behalf and control over your mute and block settings, uh, basically giving them full act as user permissions. So you may have chosen to trust this random application with the ability to post tweets on your behalf, possibly because you think that they would never do it, but why have they ever even asked for this in the first place, right? Another dark pattern example is called confirm shaming. So um, like since when does not wanting to, a site to serve you ads make you a bad person? You've probably seen these dialogues before and possibly have been influenced by this emotional coercion or like just accidentally clicked that bigger button. <laughs> um, so Roach Motel is when you get into a situation and it becomes difficult to get out of. So have any of you ever tried to delete your Amazon account? Yes. Okay, so you like know it's notoriously difficult how hard it is, 12 steps, and then basically you just have to like write a letter to customer service. Um, but the business interest in this case, not letting you delete your account because you pay a recurring yearly membership fee, is prioritized over your ability to remove yourself from this contract. So applications are developing frictionless onboarding, but like super difficult offboarding. So uh, this is a quote from Jesse Weaver. We want empowerment, we want to be better people. We want technology to enhance our capabilities and increase our sense of agency without dictating the rhythm of our lives. Today our world is enriched with incredibly useful services uh, that technology has enabled, but it's not enough and we're not done and we deserve better. The good news is that ethical design practices are emerging. We're super happy to see that we're not the only ones thinking about this as we build a more user-centric ethical digital <coughs> So just like for you all, these are some resources, uh, Humane by Design and designethically.com if you want to dig deeper into some of these patterns and like how to fight against them in your own application. One practice that we're specifically seeing like to pro-privacy movement is sign-in with Apple, um, which allows you to obfuscate your email address away from the applications that you're using. So like not all the big guys are necessarily super evil, I don't know. Um, the other is proactive support, surfacing features that help you use a product the way that you want to use it. Here we see an example of a notification that is often dismissed, and now you have the ability in the menu to stop these notifications altogether. Um, another part of ethical design is mindful data collection. At MetaMask specifically, we use a service, service called Matomo, which is an open source alternative to Google Analytics. Using data, of course, is a great way to improve user experience, but it's important to think carefully about the things that you do with the data, ideally not using it to trick people into using your services for more than they need to. So I've touched on some Web 2 things that are bleeding into Web 3, 
And now I'm going to talk more about some of the Web3 things, which are the foundations that we build upon uh, that have been part of this transition to ethical design. So user-owned accounts. Being your own bank is powerful, but it also means being your own risk manager, which admittedly can be super scary. Um, having the user in control, though, is like the main principle here. Earlier today in this room, uh, Johnny and Kane both gave talks addressing this topic, th addressing this topic. So you should check those out. Like after the conference, I think they were recorded. Yeah. Um, another principle we're building with is transparency. So we're creating on top of open infrastructure, right? So it's great for innovation and also for accountability within applications. At, at MetaMask, another principle we've adopted is explicit requests. So user control is one of our highest priorities. And the idea here is that we uh, try to show you everything, which is maybe not always what we needed to do, because sometimes when you use MetaMask, your face might look like this. Seriously, like this is how I picture users sometimes. And to back that up, these are some direct quotes from our user research. Uh, like, what is this? I don't understand. Why am I being asked for this? I just want to use an app. Uh, if there's either, I'll pause. But all the inputs, I just mindlessly click through them. So of course, like these are real life things that users have said. Some of you in this room may have said these things before. Um, so like obviously, we've like heard this feedback and we're thinking about it. And the main question, I think, like specifically, we're asking now is how might we design such that people can trade off control for convenience as they see fit? And Ona is going to tell you more about how we're actually doing that at MetaMask today. All right, so we're using, uh, am I on the um, All right, so we're using three main principles uh, on how we apply uh, some of these ethical design practices in our product. Um, Um, informed consent. So uh, we want to ensure that people understand what they're signing up for. Uh, granular control. We want to provide people with the right amount of control to manage what they're consented for later on. And then the third one is treating trust as a spectrum. We'll go deep into each one of them and explain it more clearly and show some examples of how we apply them. So informed consent. Um, informed consent is when a person uh, grants a permission to someone after understanding carefully and properly on what they're signing up for, what's the consequences of what they're signing up for. The challenge here is how do we design something without, uh, by making sure that we're communicating the entirety of the permission, but without overloading people with the information. This is an uh, this is a screen which people see today uh, when a specific permission, which is very often used in DApps, uh, to ask people for uh, consent to get gain access to their funds. Now, there are several problems with this screen today, and we've, this is uh, one of the quotes of our user. And uh, to quote them, I don't want to be the next idiot to be accepting that. Right? Um, the problem with this is, one, this is not very human readable, so the ambiguity of this whole thing throws people off. The other thing is it's a fundamentally risky permission. You're asking people if you can get funds, to, uh, uh, you can access all their funds, and that is not acceptable. So to improve this, uh, one of, this is a design that we are working on, and this will be in production soon. Uh, Christian here is uh, our designer who's worked on it. So, um, one of the ways that we have uh, managed this is we test this and this permission in one glance uh, tells people in, in a few seconds what this permission is, what they're getting into, what the consequences of it is, and why it's being asked. Um, we added one more layer of control to this, uh, which is editing the permission. So you can set the allowance that you are comfortable with um, giving, giving access to a particular tab. Granular control. Um, we want uh, people to be able to manage the permissions that they have been giving to different sites when they are using different web three applications. So, how many of you, with a show of hands, uh, know what DApps you are connected with with your MetaMask accounts? <laughs> yeah, not, not so many, right? Because we basically don't provide that as an option today. You cannot view what you are connected with, uh, let alone actually manage and delete. Uh, those permissions. 
So the Google book permissions are one of the things that we are adding, and we want to make sure that we make it really easy for people to manage these permissions. Um, and we do this by uh, contextually providing this uh, setting uh, in the right place in the interface. The third one is treating trust as a spectrum. So trust is a really big part of human experience of how interpersonal uh, relationships work. Um, when we start a relationship with another person, we often don't trust them. But as the relationship grows, the trust increases. You can uh, trust them more, and you can release a bit of control from them. This is how people and machine interaction works as well. Um, in Web 2 world, uh, it's a super trust-dependent interaction uh, experience that we have. You just have to trust the uh, company to, uh, with your information, with whatever you're giving the permission to do. In Web3, we have tried to create a trustless experience, but we, we want to treat this as a spectrum. We want to give the control to people to be able to decide where they want to be with a particular application. So if they start trusting an app more, they can choose to delegate control, they can choose to reduce the amount of effort they might uh, put in using a particular app. Share progressively is one of the principles that we're following. So when you sign up for an application, you might not know it. So you don't have to upfront share everything uh, right away with that application. You, can, you should be able to pick and choose on what you allow that application to do. Um, we, uh, this is uh, another design that's going into production soon. And this is just one of the examples, and this is just the beginning. We want to do this, extend this to other kinds of uh, actions as well. Um, another thing that I do want to mention here is, so uh, these set of permissions that uh, applications will be able to ask from people, um, MetaMask will be just an interface. We expect just to be an interface to show that to users. Now, there are a couple of challenges that we are facing here in creating this framework of a uh, permission system where uh, dApps will be able to ask these permissions. So we want to enable and empower uh, dApp builders to ask the right kind of permissions at the right moments to people in the right way. So that it's informed consent and uh, you ask only the things needed at that point in time in the application. So when a user starts to trust an application more, uh, they should be able to, um, to opt into convenience options. They should be able to automate certain steps. They should be should, they shouldn't need to have the complete level of control that they have in the beginning. Right? Um, so we are thinking of uh, some of the ideas here, like authorize with MetaMask and make this uh, like work for five days so that the user can have in uh, in tab authorizations for a certain period of time and have a contextual experience uh, where wallet becomes more and more invisible. Now, when we provide these kind of options, we are naturally allowing people to open up for a certain amount of risk. So it's important for us to also provide the required safety nets for them. And one of the ways we're thinking is uh, with spend limits. So you can have spend limits for application, you can have spend limits, like daily spend limits, and for transaction spend limits. Uh, there might be more ideas, so if, if you have ideas, please come to us, we are all yours. Uh, this is just the beginning, and we are applying for now these are the design practices that we are applying in our product. So comprehensible permissions, in summary, uh, easy to manage and revocable permissions, uh, share progressively, automate steps with caveats, and uh, provide safety nets. This is just the first steps, and we hope to come closer to an internet where we allow people to be in the driver's seat, where we provide them with all these smart con controls that they need to have a safe and pleasurable ride. Um, we are doing a small part into this. We are just a small touch point. So uh, we, were, we are really glad to be able to work with a lot of uh, applications to make this happen. <coughs> So looping back to what Jenny said earlier on um, ethics is the missing part of product design principles right now, we want to appeal to everyone to consider ethics by default in their product design process, keep that as a fundamental part, the core component of product design, and uh, hopefully some of the principles that we shared today would be useful for you in your product design. So please work with us. 
Uh, this is just the beginning. We're working with a lot of applications, uh, Zero X, OpenSea, um, and these are this a few names. <laughs> but uh, it would be really useful for us to talk to you and understand how we can uh, simplify your product experiences so that you can serve the needs of your users uh, while making sure that the security and the control standards for people are high. Um, you can drop me an email. There's another email ID for uh, UX team in general. And um, we'd be super happy to uh, get in touch. Uh, these are some of the other events that are happening at DEF CON from MedMask. So uh, the next evolution of Web3 Wallets is a workshop we are doing. Uh, there will be a, an announcement. Uh, so please come there, uh, join us in some building, hands-on building. Uh, Dan and Eric, two of our team members, they are the ones who are uh, running this workshop. Lava Mode was a presentation that happened yesterday. Uh, we are supporting Nardi, the collectible event. It's a game. Uh, try it out with MetaMask Mobile. And you can also find us at the consensus table. Uh, there are 10 of us from the team are present at DevCon, so please come up to us, talk to us. We want to learn more from you and uh, build a better ethical future of internet. back to the slide that where you have the slider for the trust. Uh, uh, this one, is it like uh, an analog uh, variable or is it you have like presets? I know something in the middle. I think it's an interesting question and this is something that we are considering here as it should be. I think we are going to an analog which is, should be uh, definable by the people. As a trust is a very subjective uh, concept, right? So you might think of trusting an application in a way than me, but for us it's important to provide that framework so that people can put those limits and yeah, start using the application for you. So your idea for now is this continuous slider. Okay, this is fine. Oh yeah, that is true. This is not a, a interaction design system. Yeah. Yeah. Um, can you tell us uh, what was the idea behind this slider? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
it might be repetitive, but yeah. I think it's, it goes along with what you're describing as ethical design. Absolutely, I think that's an excellent point, and this is something that we've discovered a lot there. Uh, this is, you might have noticed this at the bedroom since you're mentioning it, where uh, DAPs today are actually providing that contextual information mm -hmm. before every metamask pop-up comes in. Mm -hmm. That's not an ideal experience, of course. Yeah, yeah. You realize that and you want to do those kind of contextual, like mm -hmm. reasoning of why this is being asked. Mm -hmm. uh, that's that's a gap for people and uh, DAPs shouldn't have to necessarily fill that or uh, fill that in a way which is like bad aid solution. Mm -hmm. So we are trying to uh, think of a way in which these permissions are actually asked for why the DAP mm -hmm. so that they can make it as contextual as possible. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what was one case where you found yourself struggling with this ethics question where one design or Kind of like yeah. in a better uh, for your business, but not as good for Well, the thing is, we are, uh, uh, we are an open source project. We are a free, we are a free product, so we don't make any out of uh, um, yeah, any user interaction today. So we haven't like, like we have been lucky enough to not follow that kind of uh, not like been exposed to that kind of potential. But uh, when choosing the, like, what data analytics platform we have, we had a lot of discussions with our team if we should even participate in collecting any analytics at all, but we ended up deciding it's very explicitly like you have to opt into it, you can always opt out, so it's trying to keep that balance. Um, there's actually a, a list of, uh, or, or a series of medium articles that we wrote on how we uh, managed to do that uh, data collection in an ethical way. If you want to go deep into it, there's a lot of uh, different perspectives. What kind of option rate do you guys have for that? Yes, we can What kind of option rate do you guys have that for that? Like for people actually allowing you guys to? It's 70%? It's yeah, 70-80%. Yeah. Yeah, any yeah. other questions we have? Oh, we are over time. So. Oh, do you do, do, you uh, do yeah. any like click tracking and like like A/B testing for like how how people are actually using your AI? I was wondering if you manifest any analytics. Um, that's something that uh, now we are able. Uh, so we've been collecting data uh, only since March, right? So it's been a couple of months, and now we've like started to see certain patterns, okay. and we are starting to do some A/B testing, but we haven't done any. Can you, on a plugin, do A/B testing? Like you would release the different uh, versions? Uh, not within the plugin, but in the API. Oh, you swap with the UI, okay. Thanks. Thank you. Just want to be respectful to the next.